it is uh, June the 1st of uh, 2014. Um, here is uh, unser, um, sorry, here is um, uh, Macht und Menschenrechte, Power and Human Rights on uh, Jungle Drum Radio. Um, you hear us um, live from uh, Copenhagen. My name is Volker Reusing. At uh, Copenhagen, uh, there's taking place in the Marriott Hotel um, this year's um, conference of the Bilderberg Network. It has started on uh, Thursday, the 29th, and is going until today. Um, you find the official agenda, the official guest list at the uh, website at bilderbergmeetings.org. Uh, this this year, um, the Bilderberg um, meeting has inter alia issues like um, Ukraine, and um, probably on this issue, uh, the General Secretary uh, of the NATO, uh, Mr. Anders Fock Rasmussen, has been invited. Also, the Sakhir Supreme Alliance Commander of Europe of the NATO has been invited. Uh, then they are, uh, they, will, uh, they are talking about uh, the new architecture of the Middle East. Um, they are talking about um, does privacy exist and how special is a relationship in intelligence uh, sharing. This uh, seems uh, firstly to be a reaction on the NSA scandal, which has been uh, made visible to the mass public by um, Edward Snowden, because um, inter alia, um, Mr. Keith um, Alexander, um, the former commander, your cyber command uh, of the NSA, is one of the guests. And um, I would guess they will also, also talk about uh, um, draft uh, EU uh, privacy um, regulation, which is at the same time a uh, censorship. Uh, regulation file number 2012 slash 0011 COD. And they're also talking about um, the question who will pay for the demographics? So it might be worth uh, looking after the Bilderberg conference what will be um, put in the, the public discussion regarding. Uh, our pension insurance, the public ones and the private ones. Um, curiously, they also talk about uh, China's political and economic outlook and have uh, a guest from uh, China. So also this year, um, Bilderberg um, has a um, large impact for the for the EU, for NATO, and also geostrategically. Um, we have um, sent an interview request to uh, the media contact of Bilderberg, but um, they have uh, refused in order to uh, protect the uh, open speech within uh, Bilderberg. Um, in the background, you hear some birds discussing about our <laughs> radio show. Um, <laughs> um, we have managed uh, to make a lot of photographs um, uh, from the official guest list uh, we um, have seen um, Henri de Castries he is the chairman of the um, AXA uh, insurance company and uh, also the chairman of Bilderberg currently um, we have uh, seen Mr. Jörg uh, Asmussen from Germany, uh, we have seen uh, His Excellency the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, from uh, Sweden, Mr. Karl Bill. Then we have seen uh, Mr. Robert Rubin, former Financial Minister of the USA, and uh, today uh, a co-chair of the Council of Foreign Relations. Um, Mr. Eric uh, Schmidt is there, um, the Executive Chairman of Google. Peter Sutherland, uh, chairman of Goldman Sachs International, and according to Bilderberg, also UN special representative for migration. Um, then we have seen Mr. Etienne Darvignon, 
äh, Mr. Äh, Mr. Davion is a Minister of State of Belgium. Uh, he also has been um, the Chairman of Bilderberg and before that uh, the um, uh, EU uh, Commissioner. Um, we have seen the uh, Chairman of Fiat. We also have seen Mr. Henry Kissinger. A uh, well known former um, minister of the USA and involved in several think tanks, particularly often uh, involved in uh, Bilderberg. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Christine Lagarde, um, the um, managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Alexandra Mitsotaki, a chair of Action Aid Hellas. It looks uh, like um, Bilderbergers want to inform themselves about the humanitarian situation at Greece and well maybe there comes something positive out of it that we it will contribute uh, to um, helping the um, medically um, okay. the people many people um, particularly long-term jobless people without medical um, insurance at Greece for example um, well, we have uh, been able to make uh, photographs from uh, Bilderberg people who have um, sitting, uh, been sitting outside and looking at the harbor, and uh, some of them uh, driving by car um, to the hotel or away from it. Um, yesterday we have uh, seen, ah, and we have seen, um, uh, um, I think the correct uh, title is a, uh, um, Royal uh, Highness uh, uh, Princess um, Maxima of the Netherlands. For, um, for a long time, um, the uh, from Queen um, Beatrix, Her Majesty uh, of uh, the Netherlands, has been at Bilderberg. Already, um, her father has uh, often been at Bilderberg. He has uh, been a long time uh, a chairman of Bilderberg, Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. Um, um, now it uh, seems that possibly um, Princess Maxima uh, is uh, now representing the Dutch crown um, at uh, Bilderberg. Um, we have made um, several interviews, uh, which we uh, will uh, present in the following. Um, the first interview is uh, with Mr. Mark Anderson of the American Free Press. Um, American uh, Free, his predecessor at the American Free Press is uh, Jim Tucker, a well-known uh, journalist. He has written uh, the Bilderberg Diaries. Mr. Jim Tucker has followed the Bilderberg Network uh, for decades, and he has been uh, a key important person um, to bring uh, really big public attention to uh, the Bilderberg meetings. Um, uh, Mr. Tucker, unfortunately, has uh, died last year, and uh, now Mr. Mark Anderson is uh, his um, successor and uh, a very uh, competent uh, Bilderberg expert also. Um, the second interview is uh, was uh, Professor Niels Harrit. Professor Harrit um, has been one of the speakers at the demonstration uh, on the other side of uh, the other side of the uh, street where the Merit Hotel is uh, situated. And um, Professor Harrit has found out about 9/11 um, um, at um, um, what happened at um, New York at uh, the 11th of September 2001. Uh, he has found that in the dust of the destroyed um, skyscrapers, uh, there has been a nanotermit. A nan nanotermit um, is um, something which, uh, stuff which um, even uh, can go through a steel. And um, normally for controlled demolitions, it is not used because it's uh, too expensive. But you, if you want to uh, go to um, um, very thick uh, steel and if you combine it with uh, explosives, then it's a, uh, can, 
it's rather be used. And um, he has uh, found samples of it in uh, the dust of 9-11, so that's uh, a proof that um, the, it must have been uh, detonations, how the World Trade Center buildings have been destroyed, not only with nanothermite, but it has been uh, a part of this. Uh, detonations. He explains it uh, further. In the interview he has already informed uh, people with uh, speeches personally in uh, 14 uh, countries around the world. And uh, the third interview is uh, with this Mr. Lavebrov. He um, has been uh, candidate number two of the um, uh, People's Movement Against the EU. Um, in Denmark, it's a people's movement um, which uh, contains um, uh, politicians who are only uh, their member, but uh, many of them are also members in other political parties like the Red Green Alliance or uh, the Radical Party or other uh, rather left wing and uh, to a certain degree or more uh, geoskeptical political parties. Um, Mr. Brauch at the same time is also a member um, of the radical parties, uh, a social liberal party. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly um, we have not only asked him about uh, the elections and uh, how the um, Danish People's Movement regards uh, the EU and what will come after the EU elections, um, but certainly also um, how he regards uh, networks uh, like Bilderberg. Um, now I would uh, like um, to start uh, the three interviews. Um, the uh, Translation into a German is uh, is already in progress, and um, as soon we will have it ready, as uh, so this German translation, then we will also present uh, the German translation. Okay, now. Uh, Please start the interviews and many thanks for your attention. It is Friday the 30th uh, of May 2014. Um, this is an interview for Unser Politikblog and uh, Jungle Drum Radio. My name is Volker Reusing. Today I'm uh, speaking uh, with Mr. Mark Anderson of the American Free Press. We are standing um, on... Uh, vis a vis the Marriott Hotel in uh, Denmark, where um, currently the um, Bilderberg Conference is happening. Uh, Mr. Anderson, how long are you following Bilderberg? This is my fifth year covering Bilderberg, having started with the original Bilderberg Hound of American Free Press, Jim Tucker. And last year was my first meeting without him. That was in Watford, England. He had passed away, God rest his soul, just before that. But my second one on my own, my fifth year overall covering Bilderberg. Um, what are your main findings about Bilderberg? Well, mainly that it's part of a network of other groups, the Atlantic Council, the Trilateral Commission. It's perhaps the most exclusive and the hardest to get into, I suppose. Uh, it's, it's, it's one frat house that's not easy to be a member of. But, uh, you know, it's basically private governance. It's the idea that, that corporations and banks are the new constituency, that they're, they're the electors, they're the voters, that it's only their welfare and, and things like that that count. And that you know, they really have the, the, the personhood, the stake in society. Individual people are just cogs in the wheel because we're to be the debt payers. We're, to, we're the ones that pay the interest on the debts in the debt-based money system, which is their central lever of control. So Bilderberg is the most exclusive of this network, and it's been going on now. This is the 62nd year in 60 years, as many of us know. Their third time in Denmark. They haven't been here since 1969. But it's a very critical time due to the Eurosceptic elections. A lot of populist parties that don't like central rule in Brussels, they're anti-EU. And that's got to give something of a black eye to Bilderberg. So that's no doubt being discussed here in Copenhagen 2014, among other things. Do you have an idea who might be uh, particularly powerful within Bilderberg? Well, certainly the old crowd, the steering committee, and those that have been here for a number of 
years, even generations. David Rockefeller, although I think maybe he's too ill of health now. Um, then you have the Henry Kissingers of the world. You had Donald Graham here for many years who owned the Washington Post Company. He just surrendered that. That was sold to Jeff Bezos of Amazon. And Jeff, I believe I spotted him here, unconfirmed, even as early as Monday, May 26th, three days before the first day of Bilderberg for 2014. So you have the new guard replacing the old guard in old press organs like the Washington Post. So it becomes almost a transgenerational thing, not by family, but by money, by class, by distinction. And so you have a lot of that, you know, uh, the, the same media are here almost every year, your Financial Times people, people from The Economist, and the same think tanks that have been around for a long time, the Brookings Institution. So it's, it's almost more like the institutions maintain a presence here, regardless of who's representing them. Uh, that's, and that goes on for many years. It seems to me that it's rather a place of coordination between uh, different uh, powers, um, um, different banks, uh, media corporations and think tanks, and um, rather a place of coordination than, a, than a, um, a not something at the top of the pyramid. Well, I think it's multifaceted. Michael Meacher, a British MP, said last year in Watford on the grounds of Bilderberg and in the Parliament later, many have seen his uh, Parliament speech to um, uh, Kenneth Clark when he was challenging him on Bilderberg right there, and it's been on YouTube and all over the place. And Meacher talked about there being deal-making here on one level, that they all come here to get the best deals they can for their respective companies. But right away you run into problems. If you're a corporate or bank owner and you come here and you're talking to a government official, then you're seeking special regulatory or tax favor. What other kind of deal are you going to get from the government, right? Maybe pass regulations that would destroy your competition but keep you in power, keep your company strong. And so right away you run into problems precisely because of the fact that you have governmental decision making colliding with corporate interests. I mean you cannot help even under the best conditions of having a real strong potential for a conflict of interest. And I know what they say, we don't make any decisions, no resolutions are proposed or passed, but they, as I've said, they don't have to be. They can just reach a general consensus. The members go back to their respective areas of influence and they carry out the general planning and structure that they want. You know, the oil barons getting the price they want, the bankers getting the arrangements and interest rates and austerity measures they want. And, you know, but the conflicts and potential conflicts just pile up no matter which way you look at it. Uh, this time seems uh, to be um, important uh, regarding geostrategics. They are talking about Ukraine and Mr. Rasmussen is here, also the Sarkeur, the highest uh, um, NATO soldier for Europe. Oh, that's, that's a big thing you mentioned. Um, the NATO thing with regards to uh, Putin uh, making an incursion into Crimea. Um, no doubt they're wondering about NATO keeping its hegemony, its dominance, because NATO has been wanting to expand eastward. They, NATO just honored its eastward expansions, and the EU celebrates all the time its acquisition of new nations under its umbrella. So the EU and NATO go hand in hand wanting to acquire I think it's fair to say annex, in a way, other nations, even while blaming Putin simply for protecting what he says are Russian interests in Crimea. And now who's doing the killing? Anti-Russian, apparently anti-Russian, pro-Kiev, pro-Western military forces are killing innocents in Donetsk and other parts of eastern Ukraine. This is no doubt being discussed in there, just, just as no doubt for 2014 they're discussing all these populist elections that are electing people that are anti-EU, anti-Brussels, anti-centralization. So Bilderberg's getting something of a black eye, although they recover quickly. You know, they're resilient, apparently. So, yeah, these are all megatrends that they're no doubt talking about. Um. Something which makes me quite curious uh, is there are three people from China and some of the think tanks which are here are, I, it seems to me at least, um, well, they are mistrusting China no less than they are mistrusting Russia. And then there are three uh, people from China, two scientists and one even one minister, if I got it right. Uh, for 2014, you're saying they're here now. I had heard that, and I, I need to confirm it, uh, well... The Brookings Institution, the very influential U.S.-based uh, think tank, uh, does a lot of the 
heavy lifting intellectually to come up with things that are pro-Bilderberg. The idea of a United States of Europe, the idea of one standing army that's separate from NATO for all of Europe, the idea of a European Central Bank that's stronger like the Federal Reserve, the idea of a fiscal union where all the EU member nations, whether they're part of the Eurozone or not, would surrender their taxing and budgeting and the, that national function traditionally would go to Brussels. <clears throat> but, you know, they they want the EU-US trade deal, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which Brookings talked about before Trilateral and Bilderberg talked about it. Trilateral Commission being the brethren of Bilderberg. And so uh, there, there is a Chinese, I believe Chinese, you know, in his, in his extraction uh, representative who's been to Bilderberg many times. But th the question is on their other trade deal, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, so far they've been wanting to leave China out of that even though that's the biggest free trade deal in the history of mankind, if it's ever engineered, if it's ever finished. And they don't want China in so far, so Russia starts making energy deals with China. That, that begins to form this front against the EU. And then the Eurasian Union they're talking about on the news, that's also uh, a counter to the EU. <clears throat> and so you have all these things, all these pieces on the chessboard popping up. And it's getting very interesting. It could, it could get very tense. What's going on in Ukraine could, they're trying, I, I think they're trying to egg Russia into defending U Eastern Ukrainians and start a war that then would justify NATO stepping in and give NATO another reason to advance its, he its hegemony. But without going into extravagant detail, uh, you know, China could be left out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Meanwhile, they're trying to get Japan in to the Trans-Pacific Partnership and expand that eastward and just kind of surround Russia, whatever Russia whatever their intentions, good, bad, or indifferent, whatever one may think of Vladimir Putin, this is, this is how the chess pieces are being moved. Um, um, it seems to me that uh, the place where Bilderberg is meeting uh, sometimes has a symbolic meaning. Um, for example... Um, it could be, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, if you look, uh, Bilderberg has met at Greece and the crisis has uh, shown up at Greece. Uh, then they have met at Spain and uh, they, I think they have met at Ireland. Maybe some of them is, uh, this is random, but um, what do you think about this? Well, yeah, wherever they wipe their feet, the stains never come out, right? It, it, uh, it does seem, and correlation doesn't always mean causation, that's a rule of journalism, but it does seem wherever they've been, the freedoms go down the tank. I just heard from a reasonably reliable source, I got to confirm it, that in the recent Danish votes that sent some of these populist politicians into office, that Dan Denmark may have surrendered its right to, to uh, run its own patent laws for patenting products, you know, like the patent office in the United States. If I understand it right, the voters inadvertently or were tricked into it to whatever, surrendered their patent laws, the control over their patent here in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So that that's very curious. Uh, if that's the case, that would time that would have been right before Bilderberg met here that Denmark sur surrendered its patent laws. Mm -hmm. And then Spain, they met there in 2010. Now Spain is descending into more economic chaos. They've cut down on free speech almost to the bone. Even small assemblies are being broken up in Spain. And it does seem like wherever Bilderberg goes, you know, that that country ends up worse off. And and I could name other examples, that, but that's just two that come to mind right away. Uh, do you know examples of um, people who have been uh, who have uh, been invited to Bilderberg, and then when they uh, have come back, um, picked up issues from Bilderberg? Well, I, you know, that's always a tough one because again, it's hard to know with utter certainty that they go to Bilderberg and that they, they get a promotion or they come up with an idea that you can tangibly trace to Bilderberg. You know, you have John Kerry, the U.S. Senator from Massachusetts at the time, entering the Bilderberg meeting in 2012 in Chantilly, Virginia, where they've been before that. And he comes out and not long after that he becomes U.S. Secretary of State. And now he is one of the lead players at the Trilateral Commission. My inside sources told me he was at the Trilateral Commission just in this past April, late April of 2014, they snuck him in there and he spoke to that group. Then he went public and spoke to the Atlantic Council, another part of the Bilderberg Network, and said, uh, Vladimir Putin is uh, almost a new Hitler. We've got to counter this Russian bear. The Cold War is practically returning. Don't you feel the chill? And 
all these things, and they released a paper at the Trilateral Commission called Containing Russia that they, they have now posted online. Um, but my intel told me that they had Russia in their sights, and that was coming up to Bilderberg, so trace the line. Kerry goes to Bilderberg 2012, comes out Secretary of State, becomes, starts agitating against Russia, speaks to the Trilateral Commission, talks about containing and opposing Russia, and speaking in very incendiary terms, almost like war, and now look where we're at. So, again, you can't connect every dot with a thick line, but you can sure make some reasonably certain extrapolations from that. Maybe you're off a little, but you, you know, you're on the right track. Um, have you um, ever had someone speaking up about Bilderberg who has been there? I think there has a chatroom house rule that they do, are not allowed to say who has said uh, of what there, but I think they probably are allowed to report something. In my somewhat limited experience, although it's been very intense study and discussion and writing, um, they, what happens is they'll they'll float an idea that came from here, but they won't say it came from here. I think the Chatham House rule simply says, you know, just don't don't leave here and talk and say that you got this idea or this policy idea and say you got it here. You know, they they might float an idea, wait a little while till things cool down, but they they're, they're forbidden to say what was said here or to attribute the idea to here. I think as long as they don't make that link, I think they're okay. You know, and they may not all. Let's be let's be honest. They may not all go in there and agree with each other and everything. There may be dissidents in there. Maybe the Dutch p politician that addressed people that came out of the Bilderberg meeting as a participant and talked to some of the activists today here, May 30th, 2014. Maybe he's maybe he'll have misgivings. I, I don't think they're all necessarily rogues and uh, mountebanks and matoids. You know, but you make a deal with the devil, and and you know. Even the best of people can get compromised. Um, I would like to learn a bit about your newspaper, the American Free Press. Oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, it's existed since 2001. These are some recent headlines I wrote. Front page, Bilderberg meeting, uh, site confirmed. And Bilderberg Probe, a very important article, I believe. These are at AmericanFreePress.net, where you can inquire about an online version or the hard copy. That's my cheap plug here. And it's existed since 2001, um, when the spotlight had to close, American Free Press rose in its place. And Jim Tucker, my predecessor for Bilderberg, was already covering Bilderberg for the spotlight from the 1970s up till 2001, and then it carried over into American Free Press. And then as he went along, he handed the baton to me uh, a little bit at a time, and then now that's where I'm at. But it's a national weekly based in D.C., It's pretty hard hitting. We get a lot of criticism, but we win a lot of friends too. If you're going to report things as truthfully as you can, uh, for every friend you make, you're going to make an enemy, typically. But I think people come around, especially when they realize that the dominant corporate mainstream media shouldn't be mainstream and is in fact misleading people t much too often. Many things. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. Es ist Samstag, der 31. Mai 2014. Wir sind hier in Kopenhagen gegenüber dem Marriott Hotel, wo derzeit die Bilderberg-Konferenz 2014 stattfindet. Ich spreche jetzt gleich in Englisch, äh, interviewe ich Professor Dr. Nils Herrit. Professor Herrit, you have uh, made important findings regarding uh, nanothermite uh, at, uh, at 9-11. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, you are referring to a scientific publication which uh, we published in, nine, in 2009, in April. It, it has been five years since it came out and it has not been reputed or disproved in any scientific journal in the five years since our publication. And to make it very short, what we found in the World Trade Center dust was the remains of what we call a thermitic material. Uh, it should not be taken too far. It is, it is a, some stuff which contains a lot of energy. And uh, the Americans distinguish between explosives and incendiaries. 
And an incendiary is a substance which works, destroys by means of heat. Actually, it is a German discovery. Uh, the thermite reaction was discovered by the German chemist Hans Goldschmidt. In uh, 1893, he published that if you mix very finely divided aluminum, aluminium in, Ger in German, and uh, iron oxide or rust, rust. If you mix these two powders and make them react, you get a reaction which is very violent in the sense that it develops an enormous amount of heat. And this reaction can be used for cutting steel on, or armor, panzer. So it is used in grenades and torpedoes for military purposes. It can also be used for welding. Actually, in, uh, in the Ruhr city of Essen, uh, the thermite reactions was applied for the first time for welding of the tram rails of Essen. This is the first time that the thermite reaction was used for uh, a useful purpose. But it can also be used for military purposes and for cutting steel beams and steel columns. And this is our suggestion. The thermite was used also for the demolition of the three skyscrapers, as you may know, that there were three skyscrapers collapsing in World Trade Center, uh, the Twin Towers and Building 7. And there's no doubt that explosives were used. We, were n we do not know the chemical composition of these explosives but our finding only indicates that there was something in the dust which shouldn't be there under normal building collapses. Um, is um, nano uh, also used um, uh, by, uh, for other controlled demolitions? Or uh, does, uh, is it normally only used in the military sphere? No, we, we don't know. Uh, it, we, have, we have no examples of commercial demolitions where nanothermite has been used. This, this is military research. This, uh, these are military energetic uh, materials. It is not commercially available. In fact, thermite is used very rarely for commercial demolitions. Uh, it was applied for the first time in 1935 for the taking down of two steel towers in Chicago. Uh, but usually it's too expensive and in ordinary controlled demolitions, you know, the commercial companies, they use regular uh, cheap uh, explosives. We do not know of a recent uh, case of a controlled demolition where thermite was used. So this might be a hint that someone was, uh, who has access to nano thermite, thermite possibly uh, from uh, army um, um, military uh, from, from military um, might be involved in 9-11. Well we are not speculating. This is not our duty as scientists. Uh, our duty is to collect evidence and, uh, and supply the public with information which is solid. This is based on evidence and this is science, this is research. But I would say that the nanothermite story is not the most important observation regarding the collapses of the Twin Towers. Uh, if we if, you, if we zoom in on the third building collapsing 20 minutes past five in the afternoon, as you may recall, the famous building seven, it came down in free fall acceleration, and, uh, which means that it came down as fast as a dropping stone. And according to the fundamental laws of physics, uh, it means that there is no energy for breaking of all the hundreds of thousands of steel beams and columns in the building. So this is a completely unambiguous scientific proof that we are dealing with controlled demolitions. 
and it takes months or half years in preparation. So uh, it, it proves the unofficial, official conspiracy theory, you know, the story with Osama bin Laden and the 19 hijackers. It's false. It's scientific proof. And, and this conclusion is based on the oldest laws of science. We are talking about Galileo Galilei and Sir Isaac Newton's laws of motion. And they, the official account for the uh, collapses of World Trade Center violates these fundamental laws. So I would say that is the prime argument against the official conspiracy theory. Um, Ace Baker um, says that there has been a, a big uh, cloud of dust and that nano, uh, nano summit uh, alone cannot explain uh, this, uh, this cloud of dust, that there must be, have been at least uh, something additional. Well, that's perfectly correct. And no, no one, no, no responsible scientist has claimed that the World Trade Center came down exclusively due to nanothermite. Uh, in, in my opinion and consideration, at least two kinds of thermite was used because you have found steel beams which were sulfurized, that means they contained sulfur. And that is a strategy you use when you want to cut steel beams. We are talking here about a military kind of thermite which is called thermate, it's spelled differently. And in thermate you add sulfur to Hans Goldschmidt's thermite mixture and barium nitrate. And uh, it has the consequence that it, it cuts through steel much faster. So thermate was used and explosives were used. We do not know the chemical composition of these explosives. They could have been thermitic, we do not know. And but where the nanothermite fits into the collapse scenario, uh, we, uh, we, do, we don't know. We, I have my personal hypothesis, and, uh, but it is speculation. Um, how much have you reached with your findings in policy, in uh, public uh, awareness? Well, our findings, at least it has given me personally plenty of recognition and what I'm doing is spend most of my time traveling around and giving presentations on the collapses of World Trade Center, focusing on Building 7. I have uh, made more than 200 of these presentations in 14 countries, including Germany actually, I have not been to the Ruhr area yet, but I would love to come back. You know, I lived there once in 1970 and actually was working, or oh, I was a student, at the Max Planck Institute in Mülheim an der Ruhr and had a great time living there. Uh, but this is what I do, giving presentations of the collapses of World Trade Center. And so what I would say is that You know, there are two kinds of people regarding the official narrative of 9-11. There are those who say, well, we know that the official conspiracy theory, the official story is a conspiracy theory. We know that it's false. We know it's a lie. And the other part of the population who says, well, I know it, but I don't want to know it. Everybody knows that this is something we do not talk about which means that they know that there's something wrong. Everybody knows that everybody knows that everybody knows, but nobody talks about it. And this is the kind of situation which the elite has brought us into, a society of fear and lies. And this is one of the reasons we are protesting here about the Bilderberg meeting, because these are the kind of, of decisions, they are taking decisions right now behind these windows regarding the world, even though, I mean, these are the Western European countries, primarily NATO countries, uh, but it is the Western elite meeting here. I know they invited the Chinese because they're nervous uh, about the financial situation, for good reasons, 
the whole thing is going to crash very soon. And uh, the outcome of this collapse, we do not know. We know it's going to be ugly, and we know that the, the final situation will depend on enlightenment of the public and independent TV stations and news sources like you is what we are rely on, relying on to bring out the truth because the truth is the best defense for war. There is no such thing as an honest war. If you want to prevent a war, you should, all you have to do is tell the truth. But the mainstream media, they're lying all the time. So we are here to tell the truth and uh, this is the best weapon for a reasonable society. Well, um, some of mainstream media are invited uh, to conferences like, like Bilderberg, so maybe they, um, there are some issues they do not talk about um, because they are invited there. Yeah, quite correctly, uh, David Rockefeller in 1991 came with a statement where he actually uh, thanked the editors of New York Times and Washington Post and Time magazine, all the big media outlets he uh, appreciated for their uh, discretion that they have kept silent about the Bilderberg meetings for these 60 years because as he said quite openly and explicitly that we could not get along with our plans for the new world order if we had been under the scrutiny of the press. So the press is complicit in the crimes and all the wars and terror which has been haunting our society since Second World War. Um, um, you belong to the a key person who have challenged the official uh, story about 9-11 and, and um, on the basis of 9-11 and on the basis of that shock uh, we have uh, heard about a war on terror and there has been much privatization and social decline but I think the main thing probably is a war on terror um, have uh, people have you seen people or governments turning away from that concept because of learning that the uh, official story cannot be true about learning you know well you are assuming that they do not know they know all of them know all the editors know all the Germans they know that this we do not talk about this they know they play along because uh, because of the American military basically and because of their the interest of the elite um, because it, the war is the best money making machine ever this is the most profitable kind of business so the banks and the major corporations the manufacturers of weapons the weapon industry the military industrial complex they're all interested in us ordinary people fighting each other so they're setting up war they're staging wars and one of the means by starting a war is terror so the the war on terror is based on a false premise and 9-11 is the most obvious blatant lie in our time they really goofed this time they messed up the collapse of building 7 is so obvious everyone can see that this is a controlled demolition And once, if you've seen Building 7 once, there should be no way back in your mind because, uh, because you can fool yourself and that is very stupid. Many people do that and that's why I, our society is in such a state of fear and lies. Everybody's hiding out. Everybody's hiding and hoping that the storm will pass when they come out, but it won't. We have to confront the truth, and without, without truth, there'll be no peace. Many things. Maybe if we could finish this, you know, this is a t-shirt from, from uh, it's called Artists for Peace. If I turn around, you'll see in Danish the, the motto of this, of this association, and it reads, 
no peace without truth. And now I turn around. It's in Danish. Thank you. It is Friday the 30th of May 2014. We are here at Copenhagen, uh, Denmark. I um, speak now with Mr. Lave Broch. Mr. Broch, you have been uh, candidate number two for the European elections of the uh, Danish um, People's Movement against the EU. Yes. Um, how do you see the results of the European elections? Well, we had our best uh, result in 20 years. Uh, we got 8.1% on national level. So uh, that's quite a good result for us. Uh, we also, during the campaign, got uh, 1,000, more than 1,000 new members. I think it's more around 1,100. So we are growing as an organization, but also with votes. Now uh, you again have uh, one member in the uh, European Parliament. Um, what uh, is your party going to do now in the European Parliament? Well, we have a platform, uh, which I have here. Uh, and we have different issues we're working on. Uh, we have four pillars. Uh, the first pillar is that we want more democracy. We want to roll back the, the power from the EU, stop the centralization. That's the first pillar. The second pillar is that we want highest environmental standards. We are working for um, health. We are working for animal uh, welfare. We're working for a sustainable environment. Our third pillar is uh, the Nordic welfare model. We support uh, the universal welfare system paid over taxes. And we also believe that uh, we must fight unemployment and the social dumping. The, the fourth pillar we have is global solidarity. In the People's Movement we are very engaged to look at uh, how does the EU influence the world. And we can see that EU on many areas uh, undermines development in the world. Uh, but also when it comes to peace, you uh, sometimes uh, make problems for, for creating uh, peace processes in different conflicts. Um, do you mean the Ukraine? Well, uh, that is, you could say, one of the issues. Uh, here you can see that EU is not sufficient because EU is not a neutral and impartial organization. EU works for its own interests and uh, the Ukrainian population Uh, are divided in the question if they shall go towards the east or towards the west. Um, I believe that we need to create uh, and use the frame of the UN where you have impartial uh, possibilities to talk about uh, what way can Ukraine go. Uh, the best thing for Ukraine is probably to be a federation, but they have to decide it themselves. Uh, however, the EU has uh, in different ways uh, interfered in the conflict in a non-intelligent uh, non, uh, way. Um, if I understand your uh, program, your platform correctly, then you are also against EU uh, militarization. Are you uh, only against um, specific uh, aspects of uh, um, corp uh, military cooperation within the EU or against military cooperation uh, um, within the EU as such? Well, uh, we are a cross-political organization, so we are looking at the EU. And um, in Denmark we have voted no to uh, that Denmark is part of the military side of the EU. So we want Denmark to stay out of that, but we also think that there is no need for having a European cooperation which is building up a military union. Um, we want the cooperation being built from below, where humans can travel, trade, study, work. Uh, not a uh, super state. And the EU militarization involves uh, weapon exports, it involves supporting the arms industry. Uh, EU is actually often in many uh, surveys the second largest uh, weapon exporter, sometimes the third largest, but EU exports weapons to countries which are dictatorships, but also in conflict situations. If you take the Ukrainian conflict, EU still exports weapons both to Ukraine and to Russia. Despite the last thing these two parts needs is more weapons uh, when there is a conflict going on. Um, you're talking about uh, global uh, solidarity. Um, what is your opinion about the um, draft uh, or uh, being in negotiations uh, TTIP agreement? 
Well, first of all, I think that the best thing would be to make a framework globally about trade because if you build up more and more uh, blocks uh, in the world, then someone will be left out. And I think you have to try to uh, work for getting rid of barriers and customs. But the TTIP is also involving uh, special courts which can undermine uh, uh, that democracy. Uh, and I think that is a very, very big problem with it. It's how does this kind of transatlantic union uh, influence uh, on, on uh, national democracy. But also, of course, if we want a better world, how do we create that for the whole world and not only for the US and the EU? Well, uh, if we don't uh, make such regional um, um, trade-related uh, tr treaties, um, then um, how about the uh, World Trade Organization? Is it reformable? Well, I think you need to have the whole world and the World Trade Organization is not perfect. But we need to figure out how can we uh, develop uh, a global uh, institution like the World Trade Organization. For me, it's, it's difficult to see there is a way around that. Uh, but we have to make reforms uh, and secure that sustainable development, health, welfare is, is not undermined. Um, you, are, um, want to, you want to protect the uh, Nordic uh, welfare model. And um, if I have understood it correctly, the Nordic welfare model, for example, um, includes uh, relatively high benefits for unemployed people, for example, so yes. that uh, people are protected against uh, risks like unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, what are other uh, main characteristics are there of the Nordic um, um, welfare model? Well, you can actually say that our welfare model uh, consists of both a very high level of taxation, uh, but it also consists of the possibility that you get help from the government. If you are a student, you don't have to pay to go to, to Danish universities. You get a quite a high degree of, of support during those years you study. If you are unemployed, you have a short time where you have a high unemployment benefit, but after that, you will even get uh, quite a high uh, sum of social benefits if you are outside the system. Uh, we have a pension system which covers everyone in society and so on. So you can say it's an universal model where, where everyone in society gets, um, gets help uh, and it, it, it uh, connects to this high level of taxation. The problem is just that, that um, uh, if we don't get the taxation in, then our model will also be undermined. So for us it's important to look at everyone has to pay the taxes. We cannot uh, undermine the taxation side either. Um, Denmark has uh, ratified the fiscal compact. Yes. So now uh, Denmark, uh, well Denmark is not in the Eurozone, uh, cannot get uh, conditions via the ESM and the Troika, but um, nevertheless the fiscal compact is connected with the stability and growth pact and with the imbalance procedure and budgetary surveillance. Uh, do people, uh, do politicians in Denmark already see the results of these mechanisms? Well, I mean, we can see that EU is influencing our economy. It's like Denmark now has every year to fly to Brussels, the Danish government, and tell what our uh, fiscal uh, law will be for the upcoming year. Uh, and EU makes recommendations to the Danish government. And um, the thing is that we have had a tradition. We really try to fight uh, unemployment. But with the system which is built up in the EU now, uh, it's not possible to make kickstarts uh, for the economy like in a Keynesian way uh, which we used to do it in Denmark. So it's actually limiting our possibilities and as I see it we got a higher unemployment uh, uh, just because of uh, the limits in the fiscal treaty. Um, you say they are, uh, that you, uh, one of your key issues is e ecology. How, uh, what are the main issues with regard to the EU where um, you need to um, be aware regarding ecology? 
Well, actually, you could say there are many things. Uh, when you talk about ecology or organic production, EU has actually undermined the concept itself. Uh, because uh, in Denmark we have quite uh, well-established uh, organic uh, production. Uh, the thing is just that the uh, EU has, for instance, uh, allowed that you can put cancer-promoting substances in meat, which is organic, uh, ecologic. Uh, for instance, nitrate and nitrite. I don't know the English name is correct, but, but uh, we are, of course, against that. If you buy organic wine, uh, sulfates are also now allowed because of EU in the organic wine and EU has uh, built their own organic um, brand and uh, there was talks uh, that they wanted to push away the national organic brands and then only have the EU one. Uh, for Denmark that would actually be that we would lose confidence on the concept because it's one of the most well-known brands in Denmark is the organic uh, controlled brand and uh, more than 90% of the population knows about it. So if you uh, ban, if you say we cannot have our national brand anymore, we need the EU organic brand, I think it will be a step down as well uh, for all the organic production in Denmark. And if I look at TTIP, if, um, I think TTIP also is going to remove uh, not only uh, tariffs, but also non-tariff uh, 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 trade barriers. And if I look, for example, at GMOs, um, would it mean uh, to um, allow more GMOs in uh, Europe? That's what we fear, uh, definitely. And we can already see that, uh, as I said, with this court system, it seems like uh, there can be created a court system where businesses can be, uh, they can get um, uh, compensated if they lose future income. And uh, I think that, uh, of course, Denmark must uh, be able to uh, uh, say no to genetically modified uh, products. And uh, if we get this kind of system, it can, it can undermine uh, the Danish resistance on this area. Um, you are demanding a more democracy um, in view of the EU. Um, is this uh, your concept uh, limited only to taking uh, back responsibilities to the national states or uh, do you also have a concept um, how to uh, democratize the, the EU itself? Yes, you can say we walk on two uh, legs on this issue because one thing is that we actually uh, try to roll back the power but we also try to make suggestions which can create more openness and uh, more awareness in the populations. For instance, we support a obligatory lobbyist register. Uh, it is something we are working uh, quite hard with. Um, and I think that if the citizens know what politician wants and what they're working for, uh, we have actually made a, a progress in for the more democracy. So. We see it as one of our tasks uh, to inform about the development in the EU and to reveal what is actually going on in the system. And I think the big uh, impact that lobbyist has uh, on EU politicians and the EU Commission uh, is needed to uh, be looked more upon. Uh, one example um, one might um, with um, regard like uh, lobbyism is. Um, The, the Bilderberg Conference, uh, EU Commissioner, uh, EU Justice Commissioner Vivian Reading, uh, Reading is uh, there. Mm. In former times also Mr. Karel de Gucht and uh, Mr. José Manuel Barroso and Eli Cruz have been there. Would this also be a case uh, for a lobby register or only if lobbyists uh, come to visit the EU Commission? Uh, I agree that there is uh, connections. I think, of course, everyone can meet if they like to meet as private persons. And uh, Bilderberg is said to be a meeting of private uh, persons. However, uh, many uh, of the people who come are politicians. And what we actually see is there is talk uh, about politics inside the uh, Bilderberg uh, conferences. We know that when Denmark and United Kingdom applied to become EU members, uh, there were Danish ministers, the Danish Prime Minister and the British Minister, they had talks during the Bilderberg conferences about uh, the Danish and British membership of the EU. 
And I think that that is a problem, that uh, there is not awareness of what... I mean, if, if a private person meets, that's fine. But if a politician meets and actually do things that can influence our nations and, and uh, the environment and so on, then I actually think that um, it should be more uh, public what's going on. And it's not allowed to quote from the Bilderberg conferences what people are saying. Uh, and if politicians are saying what road they want to go, we know that Vivian Redding, she has in a speech the 7th of January this year, said that she wants United States of Europe. What is she talking about uh, when she is in the Bilderberg conference? Is she doing more plans about this issue? Uh, that's things I think which should be in the openness. One point on the agenda for the conference which uh, has started yesterday and which is going on to Sunday. Mm. Uh, in the marriage hotel in Copenhagen, one issue is what's next for Europe. So it's uh, very open to discuss many uh, actual issues. Yes, and that's why I think with Vivian Redding, you know she is the vice president of the EU Commission. And we know she wants United States of Europe. We know she wants more centralization. Uh, and I think that's really important to have this in the openness. Danish politicians often try to refuse that United States of Europe is on the way. Uh, so we have a great uh, task with uh, revealing what's going on. Um, at this Bilderberg conference, for example, the published uh, guest list um, published by Bilderberg Network themselves, uh, BilderbergMeetings.org, uh, contains, uh, I think, a relatively high number of people from Danish uh, economy and Danish media, and uh, but also Mr. Um, um, Rasmussen, the yes. former Prime Minister, now General Secretary of the NATO, and they are inter alia talking about Ukraine. Yes, it's true. There is also discussion about Ukraine. Um, and we don't know what will happen there, but uh, as I say, when you have these kind of frameworks which are closed and not open, I think uh, there is a danger that politicians are actually stepping out of their private role and start to behave like they are actually the persons they uh, are in work life. Uh, it is not acceptable that uh, Anas Fogh Rasmussen as a general secretary of NATO is there. If it's as his private uh, time, it's okay, but, but I think there is a big danger of mixing the stuff. And the question of Ukraine, I think it's best to, uh, to discuss in a forum where you actually have both sides in Ukraine represented and where you actually have uh, an openness about what's going on, so you can cr create security for all Ukrainians. Um, I would like to come uh, back uh, to another democracy uh, issue. Uh, um, you want more referenda. Um, mm. For which issues? What is important enough to have a referendum on uh, European issues? We think that all treaty changes should be uh, actually for referendum, especially if they are big treaty changes. Um, but right now we didn't have a referendum about the Lisbon Treaty. We didn't have a referendum about the Fiscal Treaty. And now EU is working on a banking union. Uh, and then we believe that uh, if EU shall decide when banks shall close, uh, if EU shall make a rescue uh, uh, a f a pot uh, for the banks, uh, it, it is something the population should have the right to vote about. Um, what is your concept about the European uh, Parliament um, in relation to the other uh, bodies of the EU? Well, in general, we, my model of, of cooperation would be more you strengthen the national parliament and then it's closer to the citizens, so the national parliament co could cooperate together. Uh, I think that would be uh, more direct. But uh, the EU parliament is, of course, uh, a better institution than... Uh, some of the others, it has more, uh, a little bit more legi legitimacy. Uh, the EU Commission is, uh, is uh, civil servants, they are not elected, they have monopoly on uh, putting forward uh, law proposals, I think that's very undemocratic. Uh, if I should choose which of them who should have the right, uh, I would say the EU Parliament, but I would also say I think national parliaments should have the right to make law proposals. Uh, I don't understand why it's only the EU Commission. Many thanks. Thank you.